So I want to get right into this. Yeah, sure, Gary. How would you explain what your channel is all about, The Theory of Samsara? Yeah. So I chose this title quite intentionally because there's some sort of fundamental principles in the Buddha Dharma. And as we know, then the Buddha taught three sets of teachings called the Three Turnings of the Wheel. And the very foundation of this is called the Four Noble Truths. So the Four Noble Truths most people have heard about. The first one is the truth of suffering, right? It's the truth about the mundane world, why it is we experience suffering. And then the second set is the truth of cessation or truth of liberation. So these are two things. It's called the theory of samsara and the theory of nirvana or the theory of transcendence. And this sums up the entire teachings of the Buddha Dharma because it's directly related to the concepts of provisional truth, ultimate truth, method, wisdom, whatever you want to call it, quantum reality, and the classically interpreted reality that we experience every day. And so in the channel at the moment, primarily what I concentrate on is the reasons why we experience difficulty in the mundane world and what the source of that is. And then once one comes to understand the theory of samsara, that there is this sort of suffering and that we have things that we can improve, then you think about, well, what, what is the escape from this? What is the path away from this? And that is what we call the theory of uh, nirvana. Really, the channel tag is at ultimate meaning. I think that might be yeah. kind of more the topic. What we're looking at are the existential sort of paradoxes of reality. Yeah. Mm. So what is the ultimate meaning? Is it liberation? Is it um, going from samsara to nirvana? Would you say that is the ultimate meaning of living? Well, again, remember I said that there's the theory of samsara and the theory of nirvana, which is related to the provisional truth and the ultimate truth. So in the first turning of the Wheel of Dharma, the Buddha taught the four truths. There is suffering. There's a cause of suffering. There is liberation. There is the path, which is that which leads to liberation. But these are provisional. In the second turning of the Wheel of Dharma, the Buddha taught two truths, not four. And those two truths are about the relative and the ultimate, right? the provisional and the ultimate which are seen as being two sides of a coin. But the actual final and highest level of teaching in the Buddha Dharma is the single truth. And that single truth is the truth of emancipation or awakening, final liberation. And so what it says there is, there is nothing other than this. And so it's very close to the teachings on the Advaita Vedanta that teaches that everything is uh, not separate from the Brahman. Of course, there are differences, but um, it's it's... A kind of higher level of view, higher level of perceiving reality. So ultimately, there is nothing else other than awakening. But in our confused state and through our identification with self and other, then we experience unsatisfactory circumstances. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you that one. What is the difference between the classical Advaita Brahman realization and then the Buddhist? way of seeing things and why do you find that Buddhism is maybe superior in that sense? Well, the first thing I have to respond to is this idea of superiority. And so what you often hear is that all religion is the same and uh, therefore all paths are equal and lead to the same result. Now this in itself I think is mistaken. It's not about one being higher or superior and others being lower or inferior. Really, the point is that we have a personal outlook. We see reality in a particular way and we're motivated by particular goals. And the truth is that there are paths that are more suitable for certain goals and certain results. So to go back to answering your question, we have to ask, what is the spiritual path? And basically, any spiritual tradition, any religion, any spiritual path, the practice is about reducing our clinging, right? And it is because of our clinging that we suffer. When we cling to this sort of existence and reality as being something fixed, then we suffer in the mundane world. But there are different extents to which one wants to be liberated. For example, most people wouldn't want awakening. The complete annihilation of the self and identification with any phenomena is not something most people are aiming for. For most people, they just want to experience a little bit of peace and tranquility. And let's take a theistic path, for example. 
uh, religions like the Abrahamic religions, Christianity and Muslim, for example. Now, their followers are looking to find experiences of peace or bliss in heaven. And what is taught is it's our clinging, especially our clinging to our negative habituation that causes us to suffer. It's something we kind of uh, use a metaphor of hell to explain how suffering could be, the greatest extent of suffering. So as we can see, somebody who's a very, very angry individual, right? Very sort of hateful and angry individual will engage in what are called natural non-virtues, right? They will kill or they will fight. And because of this, then what happens is that they experience negativity. So in Christianity, what do they say? Say, so you have to behave yourself. You shouldn't give in to your anger and you shouldn't lash out at others. You know, you have to keep discipline. And this agrees with what's taught in the Buddha Dharma, is that people who are virtuous then will experience well-being. This is the entire basis of the Buddha Dharma, is that delusive experiences in the mundane world arise out of our negative emotions. And experiences of bliss and happiness, for example, arise out of our uh, virtuous acts. Now, for a uh, Christian, ultimately, they cling to God as being something substantial, real, indivisible, infinite, perfect, and pure. So it's a very strong form of clinging, but it's a clinging that clings to a very uh, virtuous or kind of beneficent object. And so for them, what they experience after death, this is where we're taught in Buddha, Buddhism anyway, is they experience pure realms. People who engage in virtue and have great faith in deities are born in heaven. Now, we could say, let's take, for example, um, the Hindu tradition. And in the Hindu tradition, we've got the dual and non-dual schools. Well, in the dual schools, then they also believe in gods. In fact, they believe in many gods. But I think the way that this uh, identification with God and with heaven is presented is uh, more subtle than what is taught in Christianity. So there is still within this tradition, there is a removal of our clinging, which means that we experience greater well-being, but ultimately they cling to the existence of a permanent God or creator. These are the uh, views that hold to permanence. Now in the Advaita, what we talk about is non-duality. And this view, when you say what is the similarity between the Advaita Vedanta and Buddhism, well really the question should be what is the similarity between the Advaita Vedanta and Tibetan Vajrayana Buddhism or Tantric Buddhism? Because in the foundational schools of the Buddha Dharma, then their view does not resemble in any way the view of uh, non-duality as is presented in the Veda. So these two are very close, and they are so close that most people cannot determine the difference between these two schools. But there is a very significant difference. For example, in the Advaita, the non-dual uh, Shaivic tradition, then they teach that there is no separation. That provisionally, there's a notion of the Atman, which is the self of the individual, and the Brahman, which is the universal consciousness. But from the beginning of this time, these things have never been separate. So that sounds very, very similar to the Tantric Vajrayana teachings about the ultimate nature of reality. But in the Advaita, then this non-dual state of bliss is seen to be something substantial. So although it's a, a more subtle form of clinging to a final or ultimate truth, um, it is still uh, very much similar to the belief in a god. It's just more subtle. It's a more profound view. Because they say that there is this self, and this self is perfect, pure, unchanging, and it is the sort of uh, consistent or persistent reality uh, that is undeniable. Now, this is what is rejected in the final uh, analysis of the Buddha Dharma. And when I say that, I say, the, I mean the Madhyamaka, so this middle way view uh, of Tibetan Buddhism. And the language sounds very similar, but what we work at is the removal of all identification. So whether that be the identification of a final ultimate truth that is perfectly pure, or the identification with nihilism, so the two extremes of existence and non-existence, then the Madhyamaka is very much about uh, going beyond or transcending. This is, in fact, the meaning of the term transcendence. As you said in your question, then we tend to think about the path to liberation as going from the mundane world to some kind of transcendent world, like a heaven. And this is very much the way it is presented in the foundational schools of Buddhism. 
but the truth of awakening or liberation as it is explained in the higher schools of the Buddha Dharma is that it is a non-abiding in the mundane world nor a transcendence to nirvana. Mm -hmm. And really the meaning of this is the meaning of what is called the middle way. Most people have heard of the middle way. And depending on which uh, version of the uh, Katyana Sutra that you look at, then it's described slightly differently. One seems to be more about conduct. But what you should understand is there's the middle way of conduct, the middle way of view, uh, the middle way of meditation. And what is meditation is mental placement. It's this authentic mental placement or abiding in the ultimate truth. And in this final view of the Buddha Dharma, then the mind is free of the extremes of existence or non-existence. Now, what indication do we have that there is actually this difference? Because it's really hard to de detect. If you actually look at the words, Shavik, uh, Kashmir Shaivism, and Tibetan Buddhism look almost identical. So if you were to ask, for example, somebody who's from the Advaita Vedanta is, well, so we have this mistaken notion of a self. Sounds like Buddhism. We have to overcome this and realize that nothing is separate from the Brahman. And they say, well, what's the difference between that and the Tibetan position where we say, well, the self notion of self is wrong and we have to transcend this notion of a self. And so in order to clarify this, you can ask, well, if it's the case that everything is Brahman and there is no such thing as an Atman, in fact, they are the same and everything is non-separate, then why do delusive experiences arise? And they will, uh, for example, one answer you might get is that this is a manifestation of infinite consciousness. And if you were to ask, well, why does infinite consciousness uh, project delusion in the form of the world of suffering, which we say doesn't really exist, right? Of course, in other traditions, they say, yes, it does exist in Christianity. We say hell exists and heaven exists, etc. And they, and they will say, well, this is unimaginable. We can't understand this, which is very much the same position you get if you ask a Christian, why did God create suffering? They said it's the skillful means of God. It's not something, it's incomprehensible to us. We can't question the will of God sort of thing. But in Buddhism, the answer is different. In Buddhism, the answer is that delusive appearances arise out of the individual's karma. Now, does this mean the individual who creates karma is real? No, it doesn't. But it shifts the perspective. One is um, what we could say an objective uh, or logical concept of the existence of the universe and reality. And it's predicated upon a supreme principle, which is called the Brahman. And the other is that appearances are illusory and they are caused through personal misunderstanding or personal fallacy. This mistaken identity of self causes us to cling to reality. On the basis of that, we engage in acts, positive and negative. And as a consequence of that, then we experience happiness and we experience suffering. But all of this is an illusion. It's like the snake eating its tail. We just get caught into this trap of misconception and that um, there is no sort of supreme force who's deciding what, what appears to us or what we experience, like some sort of predestined uh, experience of the universe and the world. But it's as long as we are trapped in self-cherishing, uh, then we will experience what is called the mundane world. But this itself is an illusion. And the reality is that there is only transcendence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's pretty powerful. I honestly... It's a lot to think about. I mean, yeah. it's difficult, right? <laughs> it's not an easy point. If you ask me a question and it's like, well, okay, give me a few moments. I got to think about that. <laughs> yeah, give me, just got to take a few breaths after that <laughs> yeah. one. Oh, yeah, so the only thing that is real is transcendence. Everything else is a delusion. Or the ultimate right? truth is transcendence, yeah. But then you have to ask, well, what is transcendence? Because you could think transcendence is some mystical, mystical state of purity that exists beyond the mundane world. But this is not transcendence. Transcendence in terms of the higher levels of Buddha Dharma is that mental abiding, the mind being placed in correct understanding. And that is a, um, a mental placement that is free from these extremes of identification with, for example, infinite, pure, existent, or nothingness. So um, as soon as you uh, try to identify transcendence, as something substantial, yeah. then you've already lost the point. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. The key is to not even be attached to unattachment, right? 
But that's difficult, right? Because we say, well, okay, the whole path of the spiritual journey is to get rid of attachment. So sit down <laughs> and get rid of your attachment. And then we sit down. And the only way that we can deal with that is through clinging to reality. For example, we think, I've got thoughts. I've got to get rid of them. That is a clinging to existence. And it also is a clinging to the notion that these can be removed into something called non-existence. Mm. So we, within our attempt to let go of all clinging, we engage in the two strongest forms of clinging, which is the clinging to reality and the clinging to nothingness. Yeah. Wow. And clinging is synonymous with identification? Yeah, correct, Gary. Most people don't get this point. We see clinging to be some kind of emotion, but it is about identification. So this is where it gets difficult because for someone who doesn't have meditation themselves, then they've not really experienced what it means to cling or to have attachment. And in fact, what you need to do is dedicate yourself to your practice so that you're able to detect what is actually going on. For most of us, we're not kind of aware of the way we think or the way we cling to things. For example, you could go down the street and you'll see a big billboard with your favorite food on it. And subconsciously, you'll be encouraged to go seek that thing out. Mm -hmm. But we're not kind of mindful enough to know the process that's going on. People who become skilled meditators, then they're always aware of what their mind is doing. And they can identify these. Now, there's a reason why this is mistaken. It's not just that uh, Buddha said, oh, to think there is existence is wrong. To think of non-existence is wrong, so abandon it. It's not a rule. It's something that we have to uh, detect or identify in our own practice. So this comes to a really important point. There's what is called the progressive path and the direct path. And the direct path is engaging directly with visceral experience and becoming familiar with this, coming to identify or recognize the true nature of reality. And it's something that arises to mind. Now, mostly what we engage on in the spiritual path is what's called the progressive path. And that is provisional. So that's like methods. They're ways of conceptualizing the ultimate reality in order to bring our own personal understanding closer to the point where we can accommodate the truth. Now, the truth is, is that this kind of training or study cannot itself be a direct cause for realizing the truth. Because this comes back to the, our earlier point, the abiding or um, ultimate truth that is the persistent reality called the single truth is this thing that's called transcendence, which is a freedom from clinging. This is not something that needs to be created or developed. This is what we could talk about in the direct path. So many teachers these days teach their students with it. You don't need to do anything. There's no work to do. There's no path to tread. There's no meditation, etc., etc., etc. Now, these words are not mistaken. The problem is that we don't understand the significance of these words. We don't understand the context. The yeah. issue isn't ultimate reality. The issue isn't uh, the abiding transcendence of nature. The issue is that we have got very complicated minds and we have very strong clinging. So everything that is involved in the progressive path, all the methodology that is given in order to help one approach transcendence is about removing our mistaken thinking. It's about removing our conceptual fallacies. It's not about developing enlightenment. So enlightenment is causeless. It is the abiding nature. So if we could just drop everything, then we would experience this. The problem is that we, our minds are so invested in our desire, anger, or jealousy, or pride, or hatred, these sort of things, our ignorance, that we never really get a moment's break where we can experience a naked reality. Mm. Having said that, it does arise. And this is mostly inspirational for people. For example, you could have a transformative experience, uh, trauma, stress, or near-death experience. And then on the back of this, and many people experience a kind of transcendent peace as a consequence of that. Really, this event, this uh, significant suffering or event that happens in our life, hasn't been the cause for developing transcendence or this, this kind of special experience we have. Many people have had this, right? Yeah. It, this is a cause for us dropping our ego. Right? If we get a shock, sometimes for a moment, a brief moment, we have a flash of insight. This flash of insight is the profound truth. 
the abiding nature. It's what we're talking about ultimately in all spiritual traditions. Uh, it doesn't arise to us often, but under certain conditions, this arises for all individuals, ordinary beings. And in the scriptures, the Buddhist scriptures, for example, it's taught that there are many different causes for this. For example, you could have a really, really difficult job to do, really complicated, involving lots of physical activity, but also mental activity. And you're working really hard to accomplish something, let's say to a deadline. And then suddenly, once you've achieved that work, you achieve the goal or the task that you've applied yourself to, then you'll have a brief moment of non-conceptual awareness. And this is said to be what we call the Mahamudra. This is said to be the arising of naked awareness. And it, it it's very brief, and then it goes away. And the problem is we don't recognize it. So then there's a spiritual person, they say. They go to a first time, they do a 10-day silent retreat, and they say, oh, I had this amazing uh, transcendent non-conceptual experience. That must be what we're aiming for. And then what they do is they think, well, what was I doing on that day? I was keeping silence. And then I went into the shrine room and they think of all these causes and conditions. And what they do is they try to recreate those mm. and bring it back. For example, Jim Carrey said this. He claims to have had an awakening experience. And he was saying, I was trying to figure out how to get back there. And that's because of our misconception. We get everything the wrong way around. Causes and conditions uh, allow us for a brief moment to penetrate the veil and experience this kind of sudden transcendent experience, right? And then immediately we objectivize that. Oh, this feeling of bliss is the thing. This objectivization is the subject-object interaction, which is the cause of samsara. It's not the cause of, of liberation, right? And so we put the context of our transcendent experience into mundane framework. And because of that, we never achieve our result again. We say, well, I don't know. You know, like when I was a child, this happened. I had this amazing experience. Maybe if I recreate these circumstances, it will happen again. And so we're seeing transcendence to be a result of a particular action or causes and conditions. And so by doing that, we are actually looking at it backwards. In fact, everything we do in the world and the spiritual path is seeing things the opposite way around. The famous uh, quote from Milarepa is, the world sees Milarepa to be crazy. Milarepa sees the world to be crazy. And it's because of this. Because for an enlightened master, they their perspective of me being at the center of experience is lost. Whereas every mundane person sees the world in that way. There's me and there's what I want to acquire or achieve. The transcendent yogi doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is the meaning of transcendence. Mm. Okay. Powerful stuff again. Wow. Now, would you say that there are maybe more noble clingings than others, as in even though it's the wrong orientation toward uh, this true transcendence, that clinging to the practice, you could say, or clinging to this glimpse that we got is better than clinging to, say, ice cream or movies, or are they equal? You know what I'm trying to say mm -hmm. here? Yeah, I do. And first, we have to take this term noble and set that aside. Just because we're talking about Buddhism here. Yeah. The term <laughs> noble is specific. Okay. In Buddhism, noble means somebody who has realized no self, somebody who has achieved uh, transcendence. Not full Buddhahood, but they're liberated from samsara, and that's because they've gone beyond ego. So what would you say? Uh, so let's just say virtuous clinging uh, and non-virtuous yes. clinging. Okay. Now, in the text, it's actually taught this way. Virtue that is engaged in with clinging leads to rebirth in the mundane world, but with pleasant experiences. For example, deities. So many of us are just looking for devas and divine experiences, right? Where we are practice, we want to be born in heaven or experience wonderful lights and that sort of thing. And so this is the kind of virtue that leads to that. So there's this kind of, it's not, we can't say pure gain, because pure gain refers to non-duality in terms of the Buddha Dharma. We can say virtuous clinging. So this is why I said at the beginning of our conversation that theistic religions lead to quite good results. Because it is taught, if you cling to uh, divinity or purity, this notion of purity and virtue, then you will be reborn in what appears to be kind of like heavenly realms. So you have a lot of things that will arise for you. What the Buddha taught is that uh, these states aren't permanent. They're dependent on karma. So there's different types of karma. There's fallible karma and there's infallible karma. And there's this sort of karma that is arises out of meditative absorption 
on those kind of mundane karma. So this is very much what you're talking about. If I cling to like um, pizza, <laughs> yeah. oh, I need some za, <laughs> and then it, it just makes me kind of more greedy, right? It's not not a positive thing. Yeah. So this kind of clinging is basically negative, you know, especially if it's like drugs and alcohol and all kinds of experiences, and I just need more of them. Mm. And it's it's not bad because somebody's going to punish you, but it causes me to suffer, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, if I've got a lot of grasping, if I need this and that, then I'm not going to be a happy person. Um, that's that's really kind of course level. So on a course level, then virtue leads to pleasant things and non-virtue leads to unpleasant things. And then we can also engage in meditation, but we can cling to uh, results or we can cling to notions of um, heavenly realms. And that will cause us to have pleasant experiences, even divinity, but it won't lead to transcendence. And so in order for us to have this virtue, that leads to transcendence, it has to be embraced by what is called wisdom. And wisdom isn't just intelligence. Wisdom is actually the synthesis of compassion and emptiness. So it's what's called non-referential compassion. So it's a kind of, um, in itself, is a transcendent understanding of emptiness and loving kindness, compassion. That's the way it's described. It's called bodhicitta and the bodhidharma. But um, the reason why it is transcendent why it leads beyond this world, it's the same point I made earlier on in this conversation. The mundane experiences arises out of clinging to notions of self, other, me, and mine, identification. Transcendence arises out of liberation from identification. So if we have the view of emptiness and then we meditate, it's something that leads to final awakening, which is a freedom from you know, emptiness isn't nothingness, right? Most people think emptiness is like a void. They say, oh, there's nothing, there's no mind. That's a mistake. Emptiness is recognizing that whatever arises is not substantial or is ephemeral and has no uh, kind of lasting or permanent existence. And because of that, then we don't cling to appearances. But at the same time, it's not based on negating experiences, trying to drive them away. And it's just this mind that abides free of identification of existence and non-existence that is itself the transcendent peace and liberation. Mm. Well said. Yeah. So out of emptiness, the sage, the masters are naturally compassionate, would you say? Is there a sort of archetype of compassion or love mm. that comes about from a realized being? Yes. Yeah, so famously, Padampasanjay was asked, is someone who realizes emptiness capable of committing wrongdoing? And Padampasanjay said, no, they're not able to do that. Because with the arisal of emptiness, along with that, naturally arises compassion. But we can interpret this in a mistaken way, because we think of love and compassion in kind of worldly terms, right? So this Mahamudra, Dzogchen, this final view, what we call non-referential compassion, is a state, again, free of identification. But it's not a nihilistic state. So many people, they hear about this term non-duality, uh, the emptiness, and it turns them into kind of non-dual zombies. I mean, I made a video <laughs> on this topic before. That's how I it found you. Very yeah, oh, did you? Okay. So it sounds a bit flippant, right? Like I'm just making fun, but it's a really, actually, it's a really important point that we need to think about. If our natural view is associated with nihilism, then you become very cold hearted, mm -hmm. right? Because then sentient beings are just illusions. They're just dreams. And so we see somebody suffering. We think, well, that's just, you know, they're not suffering. There's no being to suffer. Yeah. And we become cold hearted. So the real meaning of compassion and emptiness is, is that we do not deny appearances. That's a nihilistic view. And also, we do not accept nothingness. If we have either of these, then there will always be suffering. It's only when we transcend these that there is no suffering. So this synthesis of emptiness and compassion is the same as the synthesis of method and wisdom, the same as the unity of provisional ultimate, the same meaning as non-duality. There is this space, we could say, we call it the middle way, right? Conceptually, we think of it in time and space as being somewhere in the middle. But it's like the center of experience. This center of experience itself is naked awareness. It's something that all sentient beings possess. It is the nature of mind. And so it's not that the noble being gives rise to an understanding of emptiness, and through that, then compassion is developed. It's that this emptiness 
in union with compassion is the persistent experience of mind, of, of subjective experiences. And on top of that, we have what are called the temporary or adventitious stains, and that is our confusion. Now, it manifests as anger, you know, greed, jealousy, pride, and all that sort of thing, but it's predicated upon or based upon uh, self-identification, mistaken notions of me and mine. So again, you see, we see it from the wrong way around. We think of a being who has to develop certain qualities, and then on the basis of that, certain results come about. But the way of thinking things in the Buddha Dharma is that this persistent ultimate truth, the single truth, is the abiding nature. And that is natural. But we spend all our time skirting around it, like, you know, the snake eating its tail, yeah. um, getting involved in kind of conceptual fallacies. And it's directly related to meditation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is that the number one thing you would recommend to say someone who is curious on what we're talking about right now, they don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. Would you say just develop a meditation practice? Yeah, well, it's difficult, right? Because um, it's easy to practice mindfulness. It's easy to stare at a candle. But to actually know what meditation is, is very difficult. In fact, when you see what people are teaching in general, I mean, the vast majority of people are teaching meditation, then they're teaching what is called uh, methodology or provisional. So again, as I said, everything is can be uh, classified into provisional or ultimate, right? This sort of uh, relative truth and ultimate truth, which is the same as method is wisdom. You know, it's, all, it's the same as appearance and emptiness. These two are not separate. But in meditation, then there are two types. There is what we call um, shamatha, which is calm abiding. It's a resting in tranquility, which is what most people are familiar with. And there is what is called insight. So the calm abiding, resting in tranquility, is associated with the method aspect. And insight or wisdom is the wisdom aspect. Now, our ultimate goal is to develop insight meditation. But most people don't even know what that is. Most people who teach what they say is insight meditation is actually method. It's this kind of calming meditation. And that's where we take uh, sort of an object, whether it be conceptual or physical object in front of you, or thought or concept or idea, and then we kind of focus the mind on that. That's all what is called uh, provisional meditation or um, shamatha in the Sanskrit. We call calm abiding. What you need to do is develop insight. And the problem is this is really difficult. The main obstacle we have is it's almost impossible to recognize our conceptual fallacies the way we mistakenly identify. It's kind of ingrained, inbuilt, and we don't notice when we make conceptual errors. We don't notice the inner contradictions in our own personal view. And so we have to achieve this some way. And it's very difficult to do that just through reading books. To start off with, there are very few books that have this meaning in it. But the biggest problem is it's, a, it's an understanding that is, goes beyond conceptual imputation. So it generally has to be taught using skillful means. And we can see this in the Zen tradition, for example. Right? The Zen teachers, they can't just sort of tell you, oh, the mind is empty and that's it, right? Or, you know, anybody can say these words, you know, like everything is non-dual. This is what you get on, on YouTube. <laughs> People say, everything is non-dual, don't worry. And what happens? They become uh, non-dual zombies. They're like, okay, nothing exists. <laughs> and they walk in front of a car, right? And get run over. It doesn't help, right? No. So the Zen masters had all kinds of techniques. The Tibetan masters have all kinds of techniques. And they can't directly say to you, everything is appearance emptiness, because it doesn't benefit us in any way. They have to use our own conceptual understanding of reality and then point out the negative contradictions within that. In Tibetan Buddhism, in the middle way school, the Madhyamaka, there's something called the Prasangika Madhyamaka. And the Prasangika means the, con the consequentialists. And so they don't actually teach anything. All that happens is you make a statement, like everything is empty, right? And then they say, oh, really? If everything is empty, and slap you in the face, then that didn't exist, right? Something like that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just an example of like one of the old masters would do something like hit somebody with a shoe, right? So if, oh yeah, if things don't exist, then there is no experience. But it's quite clear that we do have experience, do you see? And so then we have to rethink uh, the way that we interpret these teachings. 
because the words alone are not, um, they're not sufficient for us to understand. So it's very difficult just to read books and it's really difficult just to try to find things on the internet. What is taught is that you need a teacher. Um, and especially for realizing these higher truths like emptiness. And that's why people relied on Zen masters. That's why people rely on teachers in Tibetan Dharma. So in general, what is taught is the first thing you need to do is do a bit of research. But there's always an, a bit of advice that I give everyone. The first thing I say is that to start off with, you need to understand what your motivation is. For example, if I want to learn Chinese, let's say I think, oh, I'd like to go to China. I want to learn Chinese. And then I go to school. And the first thing I learn is the Greek alphabet. It's not going to help me, right? It's totally unrelated. It's not going to help me in one bit to learn Chinese. So it's the same on the spiritual path. And this is where this point about nothing being higher or lower in spirituality comes in. For those who just want to experience a bit of mundane transformation, like psychological transformation, become happier people, less traumatized, that's not necessary for you to study the middle way Buddha Dharma of the Tibetan Vajrayana, right? It's like, for example, if I want to, um, you know, if I want to like uh, sail to Bermuda, and I think I need to build like an orbital rocket or something like that. You know, it's like you don't need Raptor engines <laughs> to go on a sailboat or something like that or take a train trip to Boston. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit like that. You've got to kind of think where you're headed for. Now, this is based on understanding a little bit about your own personal view. In order to decide what my motivation is, I have to kind of understand what my natural view is. And most people miss this point. For example, they will go look online, they search for spirituality, meditation, and all this stuff will pop up, and a lot of it's non-duality. And then they'll go, oh, that sounds good. Everything's non-dual. And they don't even question what their own view is. For example, I say to people, oh, you believe in non-duality. So when you cross the street, do you look both ways? Of course we do, right? Because we believe that the car is separate from us. And that if we step out in the road and there's a car, it's going to hurt us or kill yeah. us, right? Yeah. That's our natural view uncontrived view. But we readily accept some other view, which totally has nothing to do with our natural view. So the starting point really on spiritual path is to first kind of be honest about what you believe, how you relate to the world, and then also think about your motivation. Now, some people say, well, I don't even know if enlightenment exists or awakening exists. How can I possibly be motivated towards that? That's true. In fact, it's a mistake just to accept that by blind faith. But what happens is, once you have that starting point, that honest starting point, and you embark on the journey, then your understanding about your own aims and objectives progresses, right? Over time, your view will evolve, and also your motivation will evolve. For example, the first person who sits down, first time you sit down in meditation, you have no idea what you're doing, right? You go, I think, oh, meditation sounds good. My friend Gary's doing it. You know, he said meditation was good. I think I'll go and I'll try some out. So at first you don't know what to do. You're kind of uncomfortable. And the teacher sees you're a beginner. Doesn't give you anything complicated to do. They don't say everything is consciousness. Everything is non-dual, right? Because it does you no good. They say, okay, just sit still and just watch your breath, right? Now that's a really logical way of doing it. So what happens is a person who's never meditated before sits for a moment, is aware of the breath coming in and out. And then they suddenly think, wow, I had this feeling of tranquility and peace. That's not only there. It was really nice. Then what you realize is there's a different way to experience reality. And then through uh, deepening your investigation, your meditation begins to develop and progress. And you are able to understand some of the results that can arise from your practice. But there is another caveat here. And this is really common in the West. Because most people in the West are like this. They come to the yoga class for the first time. They come to the meditation hall for the first time. When they start off with, they suddenly get these feelings of bliss or peace, and they really like it. But then over the years, as their practice continues, they stop seeing the results, or they stop seeing progress in their practice. At first, what might have seemed to be quite significant, then seems more commonplace. And it's as if they can no longer get their kind of kick out of their practice. Yeah. And after 20 or 30 years, many people become jaded. And then they kind of like, well, this doesn't work anymore. And they get, they get fed up with it. It's really common. I meet many people who've given up on meditation. And part of the problem here is that their understanding never evolves. They start off with a simple meditative technique 
It has some benefits, but that never progresses because their practice never gets deeper. And part of this is lacking studying and also lacking guidance. Yeah. Um, because to make this breakthrough is quite difficult. And often what happens is then we plateau. We get to a certain point. We develop like one hour a day doing shine. It makes us feel calm, but we kind of plateau. And then we never go beyond that. And that's because the profound truth itself is actually quite difficult. Another problem with this is motivation as well, because they don't understand what their motivation is. For example, if you just wanted to be a calmer person and you just do your watching your breath, that works 100%. Then you'd be like, yeah, my meditation work, my meditation is great. But what we do is we come to meditation. We think, oh, this is good. We think, what's this all about? Oh, it's about achieving awakening, non-duality. And then we immediately objectivize this result of non-duality in our minds. But we never get anywhere close to it. Because we started off with something that's contradictory, inherently contradictory to our own personal view, and it's unachievable. So in a way, we have to kind of be a bit kind of diligent, but very honest with ourselves. And that's often what's missing. And it's the fault of blind faith, just mm. accepting things, the trite statements of others. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it starts off with blind faith, but if you are really ardent in your practice, it'll turn to true faith? Well, here's the thing. In general, blind faith is taught to be quite negative in the Buddha Dharma. In fact, we're, we're not supposed to have blind faith. Famously, the Buddha said, don't accept what I say out of mere reverence or respect, but analyze it the way a goldsmith would analyze gold by rubbing, burning, and cutting it to see if it is real. Mm -hmm. So what by this, we say, well, the Buddha was a scientist. The Buddha was a scientist, right? He didn't believe in blind faith. But we do need a little bit of blind faith when we set out. Yeah. We kind of have to believe what we're doing is beneficial. Like I might think, well, it'd be really good to study uh, quantum physics, but I really don't understand it, right? But I've heard about it and it sounds quite appealing to me. So I've got to initially have that, well, this must be a good thing. I believe in it in order to go to my college courses or my online courses to start studying it. It's the same as spirituality. I think, oh, that helped Gary out. Maybe it'll help me too. So that's based on a kind of blind faith. So initially you need a bit of this. Mm. And also for people like who live in the high Himalayan mountains, in Tibet, it's quite good because they, from birth, they automatically think, oh, you have to be virtuous. You shouldn't kill things. Uh, you know, meditation is good. It's not good to be greedy. They have these kind of endemic beliefs, right? And that's actually quite good. Uh, but many of those people never progress spiritually. Thing is, they will be reborn in positive uh, rebirths in future lifetimes because they commit themselves to virtue. But there's very few of these kind of villagers who actually learn meditation and understand it, right? Mm. And on the other side of the coin, then those people who think it's totally intellectual also never usually go very far because they, they just study, 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 study. It's all conceptual and they ne never develop practice. So initially you need some amount of faith. And so based on that faith, then you, what you should do is you should think, you should look for teachers or teachings. For example, my goal is to achieve a state of bliss and tranquility. And then you look and you see what is Ramana Maharshi teaching? What is Advaita Vedanta teaching? You don't need to study Advaita Vedanta to achieve that state of peace and bliss. In fact, that is the goal of most Hindu yoga practices, right? So you don't need to go through the extents of um, like studying higher philosophies in Buddha Dharma if you just want to be a calm and peaceful person. You can do that through simple placement meditation. Um, so what you do is you have a kind of, oh, this must be a good thing. Then you should look into it. Look into the teacher and also look into the system. Yeah. What's it all about? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, you might think, oh, I really like Hindu yoga. And then you'll think, well, let's look at the life story of a Hindu yogi who is Ramana Maharshi. And you think, well, I don't like the look of that. This guy's got no clothes. He lives as a beggar. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he sits out in the hot sun all day. Yeah. Right? You kind of have to know what you're getting yourself into. Don't just kind of romanticize about it. And then based on that, you'll have some, you start to have what is called informed faith. So there's blind faith and there's informed faith. And informed faith is the faith that arises out of seeing the qualities of the spiritual tradition and the practitioners. And this is something you can do. For example, you can see a Tibetan Lama who teaches and think, does this person have these qualities I'm looking for? It's difficult because in the West, we have a different way of thinking about things, right? If I go to Harvard to um, study uh, philosophy, I don't think that that teacher holds the view of Socrates. I just think he's knowledgeable, right? Mm -hmm. Or if I, you know, if I, I don't go to a teacher because I think they're a really virtuous person. 
You know, I go to them because I think they know what they're talking about. So it's a little bit different on the spiritual path because what you're looking for are spiritual qualities. And in a teacher, then you need to find somebody who has those qualities. Yeah. And really, at its bare minimum, they need to have compassion. And they also have to have some amount of learning. They have to have something to teach. Because you could be a really advanced meditative practitioner, but unless you have studied a little bit, you'll never be able to sort of convey that to others. And it doesn't have to be through um, kind of what's taught in the scriptures and texts. They can also use their life experience, you know, to be relatable. But they have to have some means of communicating that to others. It's not good enough just sort of, you know, you come to a great meditator and say, can you teach me how to meditate? And they say, okay, sit in front of me. And then, and then he just sits there, and meditates. And you're like, what should I do? You know, you don't just sit there and watch them meditate, right? Yeah. You, you need somebody who's able to teach you. So in the Buddha Dharma anyway, in Tibetan Buddha Dharma especially, they say you need to look for a teacher. And before you rely on them, you should check them out. Yeah. This is a big mistake lots of people make. They go to the temple and think, well, this looks great. Mm. And they don't even question who the person is. And then 20 years down the line, it all ends up in a big catastrophe, right? You know, these things happen in spiritual communities. And it comes from this position of just giving into blind faith and doing what everybody else is doing without looking into it. You really do need to check it out for yourself. And the more time you spend checking it out, the less time you're going to waste. And you can waste time. I've met people. You can spend 40 years meditating and never get anywhere just because you, you, you just thought, oh, it's just about sitting on your bum. If you just want to be calm or keep out of trouble, then yeah, sitting on your bum is going to help. But if you want to develop spiritual insight, that's a different thing. And there are three tasks. There is what is called study, contemplation, and meditation. And study is not necessarily reading books. It's, it's more like the term itself too means to listen. So it's more like hearing what is said and understanding. Oh, I understand what he's saying very clearly. I understand what she's saying very clear to me. And then contemplation is where you take that and you apply it to your own mind. You say, okay, the teacher said this and this. And then you think, well, is that true? Until you've cleared all your doubts up. And if you have questions, then you ask those questions. Once you have developed certainty, that is when meditation starts. And this is the problem in the West. We don't start with certainty. We think meditation is just about sitting on our bum and staring at a candle. But meditation is about resting the mind in certainty, real meditation anyway. And so, as you can see here, unless we apply it to our own minds, come to certainty for ourselves, then all we're going to be doing is just doing what somebody told us to do out of faith without understanding why or how it can possibly benefit us. Mm, yeah. It's interesting how you said study, contemplation, meditation, when I sort of asked in an opposite way, like, do you start by meditating? And yeah. Does that lead to contemplation and study? But yeah, I like that. I like that formula actually a lot better. I mean, you can start with meditation. If you will. Sure, you can go to somebody and say, okay, meditate. And what are they going to do? Either they've heard about meditation before and they have a preconceived idea about it. Yeah. Um, or they have no idea what you're supposed to do. Something to do with sitting down. For example, we think, many people think meditation is about not having thoughts. Yeah? In yeah. fact, we think sit down and don't think too yeah, much. I've don't heard think that about the past. A lot. Don't, don't think about the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in terms of placement, that's true. So let's say we're told to meditate. Just look at this stone, look at this Buddha, and don't think. So if, the, if it is the case that having, not having thoughts is uh, the best meditation, then why don't you just hit yourself on a head with a hammer? Or like take some like, you know, general anesthetic and knock <laughs> yourself out. Because yeah. then you'll have no thoughts, right? Yeah. If, if meditation is about not thinking, then this stone is a better meditation meditator than I am. Because the <laughs> yeah. stone has no thoughts whatsoever, right? Yeah. Um, and when it comes to like what you call uh, ma, uh, the uh, uh, Ma Mudra Dzogchen or the path of Shiva in the, uh, the kind of uh, Kashmir Shaivist tradition, this highest level of meditation, it's not about whether the thoughts are not. In fact, yeah. if there's thoughts, that's fine. If there aren't thoughts, that's also okay. But in general, if there's lots of thoughts, it's even better. Um, and so somebody who has this traditional understanding of what meditation is going to have a real struggle with that. Yeah. It's true that when we first sit down, we do have to reduce our uh, useless thinking. And that's because it clutters our thoughts. We're very confused, right? We're always jumping from one thing to the other and there's no way to stabilize the mind. 
So as I said before, there's the progressive path and there's the direct path, right? Direct path is associated with insight. We have to develop insight. And there are different ways of doing that. And one of them is to have a very, very rock solid steady mind. So to practice this, don't think, concentrate. We control to the mind to a point where we achieve one of the three levels of placement. So there's three levels of stability. If we achieve the second or the third, then it's quite easy to recognize wisdom. So it's not about developing wisdom, it's about recognizing the true nature. That's one path, but it's actually quite difficult to develop that level of stability. People spend years and years and years in retreat, you know, like 16 hours a day, 20 hours a day, just meditating, meditating, meditating. It's quite difficult. You can also do that through study. So you can study the meaning of emptiness until your mind is completely imbued with an understanding. Now, again, this understanding won't cause uh, transcendence to rise in your mind, but it'll mean that you're very close to being able to accommodate that, that realization. And then you can make what are called leap through moments. So whatever the progressive path is, you have to leap through at some point to insight. And often the reason how or how this happens is not certain. It can be sudden accident, emergency, it could be all kinds of things. And then there's the path associated with the Mahamudra and the Dzogchen. And that is instead of first developing stability in the mind or studying a lot, what you do is you first work at recognizing the true nature. Remember I said in the beginning of the conversation, for all ordinary beings from time to time, there are sudden flashes or insights of transcendence. Like even when you sneeze sometimes, they say, right? Or, or sexual coitus, for example, then people will have the sudden flash or this non-conceptual moment. They don't understand it, right? It happens. We have this transcendent feeling or non-conceptual feeling. We think, oh, what was that? And then we, we have no idea what happened or how it happened. We think, oh, why did that happen? Maybe I can recreate it. We don't understand that. But in the path of Dzogchen and Mahamudra, what we do is we're very aware that that is the persistent nature of mind and that experience kind of arises from time to time. So what we do first is we try to develop recognition of that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Identify, oh, that is naked awareness. Yeah. And so we do various different practices to identify negative awareness. And once we kind of, we, we will get an idea, maybe it's that. So we go back to our teacher and they'll say, nah, you got it wrong. Come back. That sort of thing. It's backwards and forwards. But at some point, we'll develop some level of certainty that, oh yeah, that is, that it, that, that's the truth. Really, once you recognize it, it's so obvious. Mm. And you're like, oh, why didn't I see that before? But once you have that, then you can use that as your focal object. Yeah. So you need stability. You need shine and you need insight. They're not separate. For example, you could have insight, recognition of the true nature, but just be sit there daydreaming about all kinds of things and have no control of your mind. It's no use to you, right? Yeah. So you need stability. So either you develop stability and then leap through to recognizing insight. And when those two merge, then you have real meditation. Or first, use various techniques to recognize wisdom first. And once you recognize it, ah, oh, I see, then you use that as the focal object for your meditation. Now, the important point is, is that wisdom or emptiness as a focal object is far more powerful than, for example, a Buddha statue or a stone. For example, a few moments of resting in emptiness or a few moments of resting in the recognition of the true nature is the equivalent of years of meditating in stability. But it doesn't mean that that's an easier path. In fact, it's more difficult because it depends on meeting the teachings or the teacher and a certain amount of luck or a certain amount of previous karma. Luck. Mm. Well, we, we don't believe in luck, but it's called interdependence. Yeah. So everything arises out of karma. And because of that, there's various things that can trigger your karmic imprint. And so it's not certain what that will be. And for... Um, Naropa, for example, it was being slapped in the head with a sandal. <laughs> you know, but here's the point. It's not about the method. We think it's about the method. So, okay, I need to meditate. I'll look at this candle. Oh, I need to meditate. I'll watch my breath. Oh, I need to meditate. I'll meditate on uh, non-separability of uh, Brahman and Atman. Whatever you call it, we think the method leads to the result. But it's not the case because if it was the case, then basically you could slap anybody on the head with a slipper, whack, mm -hmm. and they would be enlightened, right? Yeah. Do you see? The method is only a kind of conducive factor. And it's not certain what that conducive factor is. So you kind of have to hit at it from many different angles and hope that you um, achieve the result in the end. And part of this is finding a skillful teacher. Because a skillful teacher will understand the student's disposition. And ideally, they should be able to read minds. But there's very few teachers who can do that. They do exist. If you can sort of understand somebody's disposition, what triggers them, how they work, how their mind works, then you can really easily help them. 
But these days you find very few teachers like that. So instead what they do is they do, you do something called like questions and answers. It's a bit like in the Zen tradition. So the, the, the sensei and the student will come together. And the, this, you know, in the Zen tradition, they use Cohen's, right? They say, does a dog have Buddha nature? Right. <laughs> Whatever. And the guy was like, what does he mean by that? And it's like this interchange going on. And it sounds like, what the hell are they doing? <laughs> but what, what's happening is that the, the teacher is trying to trigger that student to suddenly realize something. Like, yeah. for example, to realize their misconception. Uh -huh. Like they'll think, oh, how stupid. All my life I've been thinking that was real, but that's just uh, that's a fallacy. Yeah. And through by that, we erode our misconception and then have a chance of kind of unveiling uh, the, the kind of persistent truth of reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've heard that so many times. The guru-disciple relationship is, if not the most important, it's a very, very important aspect of the spiritual journey. Here's the thing. It's important for these higher levels of wisdom. So for the Advaita Vedanta, it's absolutely necessary. There's no way to realize Advaita Vedanta without being guided by a teacher. And it's the same for Mount Mudra and Dzogchen. But it's not the case for the progressive paths, the slow paths. Um, you don't need that. In fact, in the Theravadin and the Hinayana tradition, they don't focus on the teacher very much. It's more like somebody, it's more like a mentor. Yeah. They don't really give you instruction that much. They just kind of help you. They've got different kind of, it's a different focus. So it, they don't use the term Lama or Guru. And in the Mayana teachings, like the Zen teachings, etc., they talk about a spiritual friend. It's mm -hmm. only in uh, tantric practices, for example, like the Shivik, uh, Kashmir Shaivism, and the Vajrayana Buddhism of Tibet, that we really focus on the Guru. And it's because for this particular type of realization, which is incredibly difficult, you need somebody. Because the problem is we don't recognize our own mistakes. Yeah. We will hold on to them very strongly without even realizing that it's a mistake. Mm -hmm. And part of the process is the teacher showing us that uh, we do hold these fallacies. And that's what happens early on in this interchange between teacher and student is that the teacher will point out that something that the student held to be kind of valid truth all their life was a mistake, was just a conceptual fallacy. Yeah. And once the student realizes that, they think, oh, there is something here to be learned. And hopefully that gives them some informed faith to work on. They will give rise to faith for their teacher. And then when the teacher says things that seem a little bit crazy and contradictory, they won't just think, what's he doing? He's just messing me around. <laughs> they'll, they'll realize, oh, there, there's a point behind this. And then they can progress. Yeah. I can see that is so valuable. Yeah. Mm. But it's not necessary for progressive, like just stilling the mind and calming down and being peaceful and blissful. Yeah. Like the Hindu teachers often say, sit, watch your breath. You know, don't think, and they just leave their students. You know? Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say the problem is finding a pure teacher, right? Find a pure teacher and a pure disciple as well. Like both the relationship, having a pure relationship like that, is quite difficult, and it actually could be detrimental. I feel as though to one's journey. You know, you could create a false idol out mm. of your teacher. The guru disciple relationship is uh, can become distorted. So. Um, Yes, in one hand, I do see it as extremely valuable, but it has to be very pure, right? Yeah, but it's not for everybody. Here's the point. They say in the Vajrayana that it's, for example, if you take a progressive path, like the Theravadin path, it's a slow, steady climb, and it's not dangerous, really hardly, hardly dangerous at all. Uh -huh. But in the Vajrayana, they say it's like a, sta a snake in a bamboo tube. It can go up or it can go down. There's no middle ground. Mm. And that's the way in the Vajrayana. And it's, it's, what you say is so true. It's really dangerous. You sh but the problem is what we do is we come to Tibetan Buddhism, we think, oh, this is cool. What's the highest level of teaching? Oh, Mahamudra, Vajrayana, Tantric deity practices. I'll do that. That's the best. That's the most expensive. That's a really mis big mistake. It's, it's difficult and it takes particular kind of uh, propensity from the student. And like you say, it's almost impossible to find a, a, a valid teacher. So what we do is we come to this tradition, we say, oh, it's guru worship. Okay, I'll give everything over to the guru. Mm -hmm. And we don't even check them out. Yeah. And like they could just be a charlatan, right? So yep. they just use us for to enrich themselves. And this is basically what happens because it's so hard to find an authentic teacher. But And it's very much based on previous karma. So if in a past wow. life... You had pure samaya, and you, which is a sacred commitment, and you dedicated yourself to Vajrayana practices. Then in this life, it's quite like you'll meet a teacher or meet the Vajrayana teachings again. We can't force it, right? Yeah. So it's really important. And the other thing is that you should make aspirations. 
But I think the most important thing is to be honest with yourself. Mm. Like you said, there's these certain qualities. Well, they say that the teacher is like a hook and the student's like a ring. Mm. So the teacher's hook is compassion and the student's ring is faith. And if these two come together, huh. then there's a chance for progress. So if the teacher is a con man <laughs> who doesn't have compassion, he's just trying to enrich himself, and the student has faith, that's really dangerous. Ooh, yeah. Right? But if the teacher has compassion, but the student doesn't really have faith, that's also dangerous because the mm. teacher will just end up getting used and waste, they will have their time wasted. Wow. Well said. Well, I think you are a pure teacher. I thank you for coming <laughs> on here and uh, teaching me and anyone that listened this long for the past hour. Mm. I know you said you have to get going, but um, is there any wow. note that you want to leave on? Do you have anything else you want to say? Yes, I think the very basis of all spiritual practice is altruism, and many people forget this. Amen. So it's something you have to focus on. This And what is taught, for example, we've been talking about the Vajrayana and non-duality and all this really high, high, high stuff that's high as the sky, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But um, the safest and best path in the Buddha Dharma is what is called bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is said to be the supreme cause for awakening. And what bodhicitta is, is loving kindness and compassion. Mm -hmm. If you practice altruism, loving kindness and compassion, as your primary practice on any spiritual path, then this itself is the supreme cause for giving rise to what is called ultimate bodhicitta. And ultimate bodhicitta is this non-dual mind, the mahamudra, dzogchen, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it doesn't arise to ordinary beings. It only arises out of relative, provisional, compassion, and love for all sentient beings. And if you have that, then you can't go wrong. Amen. Love leads the way. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for coming on here and sharing your time, effort, and wisdom. I really oh, appreciate it. Really, I really enjoyed speaking to you, Gary. It was a very nice conversation. Thank you very much. Likewise. And uh, that's it. I wish you all the best. Keep doing your thing. I'll put everything down in the description for people to find you. And yeah, peace and love. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Let me know when it's uh, ready and then I'll share it with my community. For sure. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Everyone. Okay. Bye.